All right, so this is the last lecture for the genetics unit. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about three different diseases, McEwen-Albright syndrome, albinism, and tyrosinosis. Before we can talk about McEwen-Albright syndrome, we need to talk about mosaicism because it's a classic example of mosaicism. So mosaicism is defined as the presence of multiple genetically different cell lines. So you, at least two, but you could have more than that in one individual. So one individual has a group of cells that are, have one type of genetic makeup and they have another group of cells that have another genetic makeup. And this is actually more common than you think. And the way this happens is, is it can happen during embryonic development or it can happen over the per course of a person's lifetime. So let's say during embryonic development, you have a cell and it's dividing into two cells here. And then these cells divide again. And this is how, you know, during development, how the embryo is formed. So let's say there's a mutation that occurs. And so this cell then, the mutant cell replicates and continues to replicate. And so now you have a collection of mutated cells here. At the same time, you also have the normal cells that are replicating. And so what happens is, as you can see here, is you generate a collection of both normal cells here in the blue and red cells. And what would happen is, is you would have an embryo that would essentially be this cluster of cells like this. And it would be a mixture of these normal cells here in blue and these red mutant cells as well. And so hence you have two genetically different cell lines and you can see that here. So you have one in blue and one in red here. Now there's two different types of mosaicism and this is important to remember. There's somatic and gonadal. It's essentially the type of cell that this occurs in. So somatic mosaicism is a result of defective genetic duplication or mitosis because remember somatic cells divide by mitosis that occur in somatic tissues or body tissues after fertilization. So this could happen during embryogenesis or it could happen over time. Let's say for during a lifespan. So let's say someone gets exposed to a carcinogen over time that ends up causing enough DNA damage, causes a mutation, and as a result, a genetically different cell line is generated within one individual. Gonadal mosaicism is a result of defective genetic duplication that occurs in gonadal cells, so either the sperm or the egg. In the germ cells, you know, you have a sperm cell that's replicating. And so this process that we outlined here would happen in, you'd have either a defective sperm cell, and then you would have a, a population of mutated sperm cells, or in the ovaries, you have these eggs that are dividing. And so as a result, you'd have a mutation in one of these egg cells. And so you'd have two populations of egg cells, one that are two that are genetically different. And mosaicism can occur by a multiple different mechanisms. It can be a point mutation that would occur. It could be due to non-disjunction, anaphase lag, different genetic functions. The bottom line is, is that it produces multiple genetically different cell lines. Now let's go to the whiteboard here for a second to compare it to chimerism. So you may see this, this isn't in the book, but you may encounter this. So you wanna know what the, and sometimes people can confuse this with the mosaicism. So chimericism, is where you have two zygotes, so two fertilized eggs that fuse to produce two genetically separate cell lines. So you have, again, like mosaicism, you have two genetically separate cell lines, but the source of that is different. And Mosaicism is as a result of some kind of genetic alteration, a mutation, non-disjunction, something like that. In chimericism, it's because you essentially had, you know, you had a sperm and an egg fused to form one zygote, and then you had another sperm and another egg fuse to form another zygote. So this would be Z1, Z2, and they fuse to form one. And so then you have, and then these divide to give you two cell populations that are genetically distinct and this would correspond to this zygote and this population would correspond to this zygote. So that's just a quick overview of mosaicism and chimericism just so you know the distinct difference. Now that we have this we can move on and talk about McEwen-Albright syndrome. So McEwen-Albright syndrome it's a classic example of mosaicism and it's caused by an inherent defect in G protein signaling. It's actually a mutation in the G alpha protein 
And the thing about McCune Albright is that these patients, they need to be a mosaic in order to survive. If it happens before fertilization, it's universally fatal because you need that normal population of cells that have a normal genotype. And so you remember, you know, you're going to have two genotypes. You have one with the mutation and one that's normal. And so this normal helps them survive. Now, as you recall from our cellular unit, when we talked about G-protein signaling, G-proteins are involved in numerous processes across all organ systems. And as you can imagine, depending on the severity of the disease, these patients can have a variety of symptoms. Now, there are a few classic symptoms to, to be aware of. Endocrine dysfunction, because G-protein signaling is huge in, in endocrine function. Reproductive pathways specifically, they can develop precocious puberty, which is early onset puberty in some patients. Some patients can also have testicular abnormalities. Also, a number of patients can have hyperthyroidism. They can have excess growth hormone, GH. So it just depends on the nature of, their, of, their, of the genetics here. It just depends on which pathway is specifically affected, and that depends on which cell population is affected. So I think it's important to keep in mind that not all of these will be present likely. It's usually going to be maybe one or two of them, and it just depends on which cellular population is affected. Another thing they can present with is uh, polystotic fibrous dysplasia, which results in bone defects. Now, fibrous dysplasia, this is essentially where bone is replaced with fibrous tissue, which is much weaker than bone. And so as a result, you have weak bones, which can then result in growth problems, and then even uh, skeletal deformities as well, which can be seen if it's in the long bones. Obviously, they can have problems with gait. They can even have a limp. You can also see it in the facial bones as well, so they'll have facial, facial abnormalities. And then lastly here, a skin lesion that they'll have is called cafe au lait spots, and it's called this. It has, here's a picture of it. It kind of has this coffee color to it. This would be the normal pigment, and then these would be their cafe au lait spots here. And specifically for McCune-Albright syndrome, they usually have, their cafe au lait spots are usually have the characteristic of jagged coast of Maine. And they have, instead of a smooth surface, they have kind of jagged surfaces. You can kind of see that here. And they also typically do not cross the midline. So in this case, the person has it on their right arm. They're not likely going to have it cross over and be on their left arm or cross over to the left aspect of their torso. And so just to sum it up, again, it's just a, it's a, an inherent defect in G-protein signaling. Depends on which cell population is affected. And then as a result, they can have a variety of different symptoms, whether it be endocrine dysfunction, skeletal dysfunction, or these cafe au lait spots. So we're going to wrap this lecture up with just discussing albinism and tyrosinosis and their key distinctions. So for albinism, the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive. And genetics-wise, this exhibits locus heterogeneity. Now, what that means by definition is that a mutation at one locus or one location can cause the same phenotype as a mutation from a totally different locus or location. So, for example, you could have one chromosome here, and you have this gene that's affected, can cause albinism, and then you could have a totally different chromosome, the totally different gene, and that's mutated, and they cause the same phenotype. even though they're in completely different locations. So that's locus heterogeneity. Now, albinism results from a, a defect in the tyrosinase enzyme within melanocytes, which are cells in skin responsible for producing the melanin, which is the pigment that gives skin color. So if we look at this diagram here, we went over this in the amino acid metabolism lectures. And remember, we marked this diagram by location in the body in which these enzymes are most active. So we, here we have the skin. And we have this enzyme here, which is the Stark corresponding to tyrosinase. So you have phenylalanine, which is then converted to tyrosine, which is then converted to dopa, and then dopa is converted to melanin in the skin, in melanocytes. However, if this is defective, this doesn't happen, and you have a major decrease in melanin. And as a result of the lack of melanin, you have an absence of color. Now, what's key to remember with this disease is that the number of melanocytes is completely normal. It's not a matter of decreased numbers of melanocytes. 
It's just a defective enzyme within the melanocytes that leads to decreased melanin. And as a result of that, decreased pigment, which then gives you these features. So lack of skin pigment, so you have white skin. It also affects the eyes. You have lack of pigment in the eyes, so you can have red eyes, photophobia as a result of that decreased pigment, which protects the eyes. Uh, you could have nystagmus. You could have white hair because you have loss of pigment in the hair. And also, melanin serves as a protective mechanism in melanocytes from the sun. And so these patients have an increased risk of skin cancer as well. And then lastly here we have tyrosinosis. The inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive, and it is caused by a defect in fumarole acetoacetate hydrolase. That's a mouthful. Which is this enzyme here, indicated by B. You can see this here in our little key here. So this enzyme's out, so you can't break down fumarole acetoacetate into fumarate and acetoacetate, which is important because fumarate can then go into the citric acid cycle and be a part of metabolism and energy production. And what also is a problem is you have a buildup of fumarole acetoacetate and then also a buildup of tyrosine. Now where that causes problems is specifically the buildup of fumarole acetoacetate in the liver this can cause problems in the liver because it can cause cirrhosis, hepatitis, and cancer of the liver. And then if it builds up in the kidney, it can cause things such as renal tubular acidosis and amino acid urea. The other thing is that you have a buildup of tyrosine. Now tyrosine itself is not toxic to the liver or the kidney, but it can, it can be toxic to the skin. It can be toxic to the brain as well. And so that can cause problems as well. The main way you would treat this is the, that you would restrict tyrosine in the diet because if you re restrict tyrosine, then you're going to decrease the amount of fumarole acetoacetate that's pr produced, which then decreases toxicity to the liver and the kidney. All right, so that wraps up our discussion of mosaicism with our example of mccune albright syndrome, and then it also wraps up our discussion of albinism and then tyrosinosis, and it also wraps up the genetics unit. Next, we're on to the systemic disorders unit.